Hello everyone and welcome into another edition of Smith and Hesson. Ian Smith here of course in New Zealand. Mike Hesson sitting in that all too familiar room that we're getting to know almost as well as him now uh, on the other side of the world in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Hess, uh, good afternoon to you. New Zealand time anyway, I know it's early morning for you. Another week gone by in the IPL. Um, a run chase that didn't go so well for you guys against uh, the Deccan Chargers, but by and large, you're happy with your, your spot on the table? Yeah, look, we're, um, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but we are sort of a, a developing team. We've obviously come up three pretty tough years, but it's our best start since 2011, um, sort of in terms of where we're, where we're sitting at the moment. So we're sitting third, um, you know, right in the hunt. Uh, we've now got three or four days off, and then we've got four games in eight days. So it's going to be a tough week ahead. Uh, and that's probably going to define how we uh, how we end up sort of in the pool play uh, scheme of things. If we look at the table now, uh, the Mumbai Indians are on top with eight points. Of course, they've had uh, an extra game. Uh, you're on six. Deccan are, are floating around two uh, in second spot in terms of uh, run difference, etc. And Kings Punjab 11 are the side that are really struggling, just two points from five games. I want to take a, a look at um, the Mumbai side, if I could, with you and the players that are actually achieving. And last week we spoke about the quicker bowlers. And boy, do they have a, a, a trio when they're, uh, when they're all firing. Bolt, Boomerang and Pattinson, of course, James Pattinson, uh, and almost a backup bowler for the Australian Test squad, but a very, very capable one indeed. And it looks like they're, do they're, they're playing them, and, and Shane Bond, of course, is responsible for that, playing them as a trio, and they're getting early wickets, which is helping immensely. Yeah, they're certainly getting power play wickets, but all three of them have actually done a pretty good job at the death um, in most games. So they're, I mean, they're four from six. Um, they've, you know, when they've uh, when they've won, they've dominated sides. And you're right, as a bowling unit, they they work together nicely. Uh, Trent Bolt's been excellent. He's often got a wicket up front, um, and he's done the tough job at the back end. And you know, he closed the game out uh, the other day, which was a you know, which was a tight game, and, and he came on and bowled the, the penultimate over. So. Look, he's, he's done a nice job. Boomer, um started slowly, uh, but they were able to afford that because the other two were going so well. And now he's found his feet. There's certainly a, an imposing uh, threesome. And in terms of that, um, uh, you know, the batting lineup, they sort of bat deep and they got power all the way down. So not surprisingly, they were, you know, one last year and, and they're probably mm. the favourites that are on paper. Shane Bond's influence there. I mean, we've seen Shane Bond in a, a bowling coach role, a head coach role, actually, in... Uh, the BBL in, in Australia, but principally a, a bowling coach with our national side. And, and now, of course, he's the bowling coach for the Mumbai Indians, has been for a little period of time. His influence and, and your knowledge of Shane Bond, the coach? Yeah, look, Bond, he's, um, he's not afraid to put the hard work in. So he certainly does a lot of hours in front of the video screen in terms of coming up with plans um, and then selling those plans to the bowlers, um, you know, in terms of certain fields. Um, at different times of the innings. I mean, he talks about wanting to be unpredictable. Um, so he's really comfortable with setting fields where it gives you at least two options, um, sometimes three as a bowler. So you, 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 even though you're well planned, as I said, you can't just be lined up and be predictable. So he does a lot of work. He's got a great relationship with Rohit Sharma. Um, so, I mean, that, that relationship, bowling coach and, and captain is so important in terms of agreeing to plans and getting that buy-in. Um, and as I said, he's got some pretty good cattle there as well. You know, three pretty good, um, pretty good seamers. But um, I think they've recruited well as well. Well, they have. If you look at uh, you, you've mentioned uh, right Sharma, who I believe is uh, one of the premier white ball batsmen in the world. Um, both those forms of the game, but also and Quinton de Kock as well. Uh, what a great player he's turning out to be for them. And their their overseas content, as you say, has has been put together quite nicely. Yeah, well, the, I guess the beauty of someone like Quinton de Kock, I mean, he never looked like scoring a run the first sort of three games. and But because they've got a well-balanced side, they can afford to stick with them. And they, you know, they trust that that's the side that's going to see them home. And then as soon as Quinton hits form, then once again, they've got sort of four or five of their top, you know, top order firing. And then they look more formidable. But it's the fact that they've got that depth in terms of um, the batting depth that different players stand up at different times, as I said, allows them to be a little bit more... Uh, patient with some of the players who are going through slumps. One of the pieces of news coming out of New Zealand is that Ben Stokes has apparently left Christchurch after spending some time with his father, who's, who's critically ill, of course. Um, and pretty tough goodbye for him to come over and join the IPL. Now, 
obviously a player like that, he has to go through the process of waiting and quarantining, is that correct? So he won't really be a factor for quite some time yet. Uh, well, he's only got six days. So um, so he's got one... He, Rajasthan Royals played last night, so he was unavailable for that. Uh, I see he's got a treadmill in his room and a, and a bike on his lawn out the front. So he's... Um, you know, he's obviously keeping himself fit, and, and I'd imagine he'll become straight available the next game. So, um, yeah, look, it's nice to to see Ben over here. Um, you know, obviously he's decided he, he wants to play a part, so certainly wish him well. Uh, we mentioned uh, last summer uh, the bidding war um, that was going on for Pat Cummins. Uh, I think you might have been an underbidder or involved in this somewhere. Um, and I think Brendan McCullum actually ended up getting him. Has that been a good buy so far? Mega bucks. He certainly had some a couple of good games. I mean, they've used him in a slightly different role. So, um, look, initially they used him straight off the out of the quarantine bubble or pretty much mm. straight off the plane. He hadn't done anything for seven days. And as a frontline seaman, that's going to be a tough ask. So the first day out was literally he was released at lunchtime and and playing at six o'clock that night. So he, he struggled in his first game, but he's certainly been pretty good since then. Um, contributed a little bit with the bat as well. It's tough though, when you've got a high price tag like that, in terms of um, what the expectations are. And I think even even Pat admitted that, um, you know, it played on his mind a little bit, especially after a, after a poor performance. So yeah, there's a lot of little inner demons that crop up, depending on uh, whether you think you're overpaid or underpaid. Trent Bolt aside, it's been, would you fair to say, slightly disappointing time of it so far for the New Zealand players. Now, Kane Williams had a good knock initially and then it's failed a couple of times. Two or three players haven't even had, got stripped, really, in terms of being serious contenders for being out there. And Jimmy Nation's been left out of late, too. So a pretty low-key sort of uh, New Zealand event. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, limited impact, really, in terms of the IPL so far. I mean, Kane was run out the other day. Um, you know, just when he was starting to get underway, so couldn't take too much out of that. But he's he's a big player for the Sunrisers, and, and for them to progress, he's going to have to have a big tournament um, to back up Warner and Besto, uh, which obviously we know he's capable of. Yeah, and Jimmy Neesham, I mean, he was batting sort of seven or eight, used as a as a bowler, a bowler at the death, which you know is not really a strength of his. Um, you know, and you know to bowl at the death over here when against set batsmen is a tough job, and. As I said, he doesn't really do that in, in for many teams around the country at all or, or around the world. So um, he was sort of set up to not do so well there. With the bat, he had one chance, didn't perform very well. Uh, but Kings Eleven have chopped and changed a little bit, and it's hard to see him get too many opportunities in the near future. Mm. Uh, Jimmy Neesham uh, has made a few headlines back here, and uh, not for the first time uh, that I can recall. Uh, he, he enjoys being on Twitter. He enjoys engaging and even challenging people, but uh, he's had a crack at Arkash Chopra and Chopra's had a go back at him. And I'm not sure Jimmy should continue to go into those sorts of things because uh, my opinion on that is that at the end of the day, uh, you can't win as a player because it, you're going to have bad days and they're waiting for you. Yeah, well, I think that's a pretty good assessment, Smithy. I don't think that you can win any of those battles and in all honesty, um, for me, when you're in the playing phase, I, I, you know, I think you're best to stay away from that stuff entirely. Uh, when you're away from playing, no problem. Um, you know, maybe post the odd pick if you're in the gym or doing whatever. But I, I think getting in those can just distract you. Um, I mean, Jimmy's his own man. He's got his own, he's got his own beliefs, his own personality. I guess he's trying to build a media profile. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not so sure you can win those battles. No, I, I don't think you can. <clears throat> But I'm also seriously conscious of the value of social media to, uh, to sport, uh, bringing players closer to the public and, and, and that sort of thing. And particularly at a time like this where you can't go to the ground, you can't see the players, you can't get autographs from the players. I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because you, you like the upside of them being in contact around. It's just, it's just whether you've got to count to 10 before sometimes you make these calls and make these tweets. Yeah, I, yeah, and I think for some people it can be a distraction. Like it can take you away from your core business. So you, you, you're spot on. People love that that connection, and some people are very good at it. And James is, is funny. Like he's you know he's got a good following because he you know he's he's not afraid to to challenge people. But um, I think the idea you know the ability to separate the playing side and and your your social media profile I think are quite two different things. Mm. 
Okay, um, we spoke last week about the, um, the White Ferns who are doing battle in, in Australia, and as we speak right now, it's game three of the one-day series, and they're trying to chase down uh, 325, which is a hell of an imposing target uh, against uh, an Australian side. And, and I think our, our words last week have, have rung true in that um, whilst they have won one of the T20s, it was a dead rubber. Uh, but Australia just pound for pound, I think, uh, just a little bit more too skillful in most areas. Yeah, they are. I mean, we talked about depth last week. I mean, there's so many different players in the Australian side that have stood up and, as I said, um, either chased down a total convincingly with overs to spare or set imposing totals. There haven't been too many games that have gone down to the wire. And I think that's probably the most frustrating thing, I think, from a from a, a White Ferns fan. I think they're, um, they haven't quite been able to apply enough pressure to, to the Australian side. Um, you know, Amelia Kerr was very good in that, in that T20 that they did win uh, with both bat and ball. Um, and there's been little, there's been performances here and there, but certainly as a, as a team, they just haven't been able to apply enough pressure. Uh, and I, what worries me, if I look at it, um, you know, they could play Australia every year if you like. Um, but, and you mentioned it just there, the production line from Australia, the new names seem to be deliver, delivering more so than the New Zealand version of that. We're so top heavy reliant on Kerr now, obviously, the big... I call them the big three. That's Kerr, Bates, and Devine, really, until Sather Swate gets back up to speed. Uh, I, and I don't think that's enough. No, I don't think it is in any side. And I think that, you know, Bob Carter and his team um, have got to work diligently to try and find or unearth some, some new talent and then be able to provide them those opportunities. And, and that's not easy. You know, we don't have an abundance of that. But it is, you know, that scouting process, that ability to identify talent therefore invest. And I mean, obviously, Amelia Kerr was probably an easier one in terms of she she rose to, um, you know, to everyone was well aware of her when she was 14, you know, that she was always going to play for the White Ferns at some stage. So it's just identifying that next group, as I said, providing them with enough opportunity um, at the level below to try and bridge the gap and then introduce them at the right time because uh, we certainly need a little bit more depth. We certainly need, um, you know, a few more match winners in that lineup for sure. In terms of the Black Caps, there's uh, no overseas action this summer because uh, the, the Chapel Hadley series as such has been canned, as uh, Australia have also canned the Test match against Afghanistan and Perth. So while they're trying to control things a little bit more, uh, obviously they're not going to touch that Indian series because that is a, a big money one for that. Um, if, in terms of that, it, it's a high profile for one for us on Sky as well. Uh, Virat Kohli, do, do you speak to him about those forms of cricket I mean have you had a chance to talk about that upcoming tour because I know you're focused on the, on the job in hand but man he is so key and India is so much looking at that series yeah look we certainly have time around the breakfast table to, to talk about all sorts of stuff and uh, you know some of those things we talk about obviously when he's, he's touring and we sort of share experiences I guess of how we've coped with touring Australia or South Africa or wherever we've gone and the, the challenges we've faced so he certainly loves that uh, that combative approach of Australia in Australia. Um, that he sort of thrives on that. Um, you know, talks about uh, you know the fact that you know you do feel like you're up against it, and uh, he certainly thrives on that. And he's he's trying to change his team in terms of getting that, or actually enjoying the battle, you know, mm. rather than being uh, being consumed by it. And certainly also uh, the change in mentality from where it was maybe four or five years ago, where they're just trying to compete. So now they're actually going over there to, to dominate. And they've certainly got a, a line-up that can challenge anyone in any conditions. Um, mm. I think the fact that team bowlers now are as good as a good a duo or, or threesome as, as any, um, you know, three-pronged attack in the world um, will certainly hold them in good stead over there. Yeah, well, that's coming up on Sky Sport, obviously. Uh, it'll be on Channel 52 uh, over pre-Christmas, of course, and then uh, into Boxing Day and into the, the latter part of summer as well. And it's... Uh, going to be a real highlight. I think the standard of cricket on that will be far greater than uh, we're going to have at home with what the Black Caps are up against this time around. But one of the interesting things for me that came out of the schedule that's been finalised is that they're moving the Boxing Day test away from Hagley Oval in Christchurch, a beautiful ground down there, of course, uh, to the Mount, uh, which, is, uh, which has also proven to be quite successful. Um, that's a test match against Pakistan. I wonder about that because I'm not quite sure the people of Christchurch have done anything wrong because uh, my memory of it is it's always been hugely well supported and New Zealand have done well there. 
Oh, it's been a great venue. I mean, we've played there, um, you know, most years over the last, you know, since they've gone back to Boxing Day Test. There was one at the Basin, uh, but outside of that, we've been at Hagley. Uh, and the support has been incredible, e even against lesser sides. Um, you know, we've, we've played Bangladesh there, Boxing Day. Um, we've played sides that potentially don't always get the biggest crowds, but, um, you know, the Christchurch public have been exceptional. And, uh, you know, I recall warming up on many Boxing Days and, and the crowd filling up and, creating a great atmosphere. So, yeah, I mean, the Hagley Park is a fantastic venue um, for Test cricket. And I, I think, um, you know, I'm reading between the lines here, really thinking New Zealand cricket are keen to get another venue um, that, it, you know, and test out the Bay Oval. Um, the Bay Oval is a, uh, is a wonderful venue as well. Um, and last year, obviously, against England, it produced a, a pretty good Test match. Um, so, look, I think uh, at a holiday destination, maybe they're just trying to test it out so they've got an alternative venue. Yeah, interesting. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that, but um, I'm not sure about um, why it's gone up there. I'm not quite sure whether I've, I've read the reasons. I see your holiday crowd sort of things, but quite often people go to the holiday, you know, go on holiday to go to the beach, but however, uh, it's not too far from the beach. Yes, uh, your next project is what? Coming up in about four days' time, your next match day. Um, one you uh, seriously have got to win. Tell us a wee bit about your opposition. Yes, we play CSK on the tenth. So um, you know, Chen and I, you know, haven't missed the playoffs uh, since it started. So um, they're they're obviously a formidable side. That they struggled a bit um, to start with. In their last match, they won by ten wickets against Kings Eleven. So they're certainly uh, on the way up. Uh, they've got one more game tonight. Um, so it gives an, another chance for us to have a look at them before we, um, you know, we take them on in three days' time in Dubai. So. Uh, look, as I said, we, we've won some close games. A uh, couple of games we were we weren't very good. Um, so we've uh, we know ourselves. We've got to play well to compete. So that's uh, as a, as a side, that's what you want. You want to know you've got to front up and perform. And CSK are, are an older, wiser wiser team. Mm. They're sort of experienced. Uh, I think Stephen Fleming the other day um, got asked about how his young guns are going, and he he just had to remind them that he hasn't got any. Um, and his lineup, he's certainly got a. As I said, an old, experienced side, and when they're on form, they're you know they're tough to beat. So we've got to play well. He flies under the radar, Stephen Fleming, doesn't he? I mean, it, it, you never know when he's back in New Zealand, except for about one day a year when they had that Mickey Mouse Rugby vs Cricket Day, and apart from that, well, a little bit of golf as well. And then over there, he stays pretty quiet too. Yeah, he was quiet, but they had a camera on him. They had a, like a Fleming cam on him the other day because they'd come off three losses. He was under a little bit of pressure. I think he was playing the game a little bit. He was quite animated uh, when they were in the field. And, uh, yeah, look, I think he's, he's just trying to take a bit of pressure off the rest of his team who, who had been battling at the time. But, yeah, as I said, they've certainly... A uh, team wicket win certainly gets them back on the radar, that's for sure. Well, uh, changing codes here. So I know you're a big rugby fan. You've had an association with the, the Hurricanes close up over the years. Uh, All Blacks this weekend, uh, Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock New Zealand time on Sky Sport. The one, what, will you get a chance to watch it? What's the time zone like? Oh, time zone's not great, but I tend to watch most All Black tests. So mm. I'll, um, you know, we're, we're also a pretty strange time over here. We don't often finish till midnight. So, um, yeah, well, look, I'll get up and watch it. Um, obviously, hopefully, well, I think there'll be a few new faces. Um, obviously, having watched the uh, Super Rugby, the um, AAT Aroa thing, there was some, you know, mm. some great battle there, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, on Sky as well. So, yeah, I'll be getting up and, and hoping some of those new faces will stand up. Well, two new faces, actually, uh, in your department, in the coaching department. Finally, Ian Foster gets to hold the reins. And, of course, Dave Rennie was so used to Hanson v Checker and Hanson, of course, dominating that battle quite uh, markedly. But we're, we're now looking at Foster versus Rennie. So these two test matches, in terms of betting yourself in, as a, from a coaching point of view, uh, really, really important confidence-wise because coaches must have confidence issues as well. Well, it's also when you start, you know, your players are, are, are basically gauging you as well. So, you know, that the way you start, the the judgments they make about you in the first sort of week or two weeks um, is, you know, it's pretty hard to change those first impressions. So um, it's going to be incredibly important. And Dave Rennie's uh, obviously, they've both been involved in the Chiefs, so they'll, they'll be they'll know each other well. Um, I'm sure uh, there'll be that little internal battle in terms of trying to get one up over the other. But I think more importantly, it's how they start to work with their with their group that they're going to have to try and plan for a few years um, ahead. And as I said, just try and bed in those relationships. So yeah, certainly a big a big couple of weeks ahead for both those boys. And for you on Sunday, yes, uh, we'll leave it at that. Wish you all the best. 
make sure you get up over Fleming and CSK. That would be good. Um, and stay healthy, mate. And uh, they don't even give you a new room. You just get the same one. You can't sort of pop over the other wing of the hotel and have a look at the out, out another window. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Same view, but we have, as I said, we have got a team room, which is nice. Yeah. But another COVID test this morning, number number 16. So looking forward to that. Okay. All the best, mate. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you.